Hi, it's Red Recapped here. Today I'm going to describe a movie called, Law Abiding Citizen, which came out in 2009. There will be some spoilers in the following. So, let's begin the film without further ado. The movie opens with a loving husband and father, Clyde Shelton, working on something while his cute daughter sits beside him, customizing beaded bracelets. When Clyde asks what she's doing, she says that it's a necklace for her mother's birthday. Soon they have their door knocked on, and Clyde's wife tells him to open it. Once he does so, he gets knocked down using a baseball bat, and two robbers enter the house. The robbers immediately tie his hands, and when his wife comes, they mercilessly beat her as well. As one of the robbers, Rupert Ames, starts looting the house. The other one, Clarence Darby, tells Clyde that he can't fight fate and stabs him in the abdomen. Darby subsequently compels Clyde to watch his wife's murder and rape while Rupert is telling him to stop what he's doing and leave the house. However, Darby tells him to shut up. When they notice that Heather, Clyde's daughter, is there, Darby goes to her. Clyde wails in helplessness. In the following scene, we get to know Clyde's district attorney, Nick Rice. As the two meet, Clyde hands Nick some notes, thinking they might help with the case. Clyde believes the justice system is really looking out for people's rights. But the case turns out to be compromised by a bungled forensic investigation, and Clyde's testimony cannot incriminate either man because he blacked out during the incident. Nick, on the other hand, is willing to maintain his 96% conviction rate and makes a secret deal with Darby, in exchange for pleading guilty to third-degree murder, he will provide testimony that will send Rupert to death row for what is, essentially, a robbery charge. And the main culprit, Darby, will be sentenced to up to five years. When Nick considers it a win, it's as if he's spitting in Clyde's face. Clyde is shocked at what he just heard, desperately begging Nick not to take the deal, but the decisions have already been made. In the courtroom, the whole crime was staged as if Rupert were the main culprit. Despite his condition, an evil Darby never stops insulting Nick's wife. But Nick shushes him and forces him to sign the plea deal before he changes his mind. Outside, Nick makes a statement to the press about the verdict, and Darby sarcastically thanks him for being by his side. Clyde is observing all of this from a distance and is left feeling betrayed. After a hard day at work, Nick returns home to his wife, Kelly, and to calm his nerves, he talks to his daughter in his wife's belly. The movie then fast forwards 10 years, when Nick's daughter has grown up. She has a violin recital for the night, but instead of a heartening presence besides her, Nick skips the show as he's just as busy as ever. Kelly is dismayed that he is neglecting his daughter's life because he's too occupied with his career. Today is the day of Rupert's execution. So, Nick, along with his co-worker, Sarah, attend Rupert's execution. Rupert says in his final words that what he did that night was wrong but he swears that he didn't kill Clyde's family and that the wrong man is dying here today. The execution will be through a lethal injection, which is designed to be painless. So, he's injected with three different sedatives administered in a specific order to lower the pain. But when the execution starts, strangely enough, he begins to shake and scream in pain, dying an agonizing death. The incident hurts everyone's feelings, including Nick, who had been behind Rupert's misery. Outside, Nick asks the warden about the motives behind making the injection machine dysfunctional and wants a list of people with access to the machine, but the warden refuses to cooperate. A police officer then approaches them and delivers a bottle with the phrase can't fight fate inscribed on it. Nick recognizes the term and reveals to others that Darby told him just the exact words in the courtroom and to Clyde during the invasion. Elsewhere, Darby is sniffing a substance at his house while watching the news about Rupert's execution. Suddenly, he receives a call from a private number. He hears a muffled voice tell him what's present in his house in meticulous detail, which freaks out Darby. The mysterious man even notices the junkie prostitute lying face down on the couch. When the speaker orders him to glance out the window, he notices cops on all sides approaching him. So he immediately runs outside while firing at the police. After some chasing and shooting outside, he gets another call. The muffled voice tells him that he must surrender the pistol and proceed to the abandoned factory because he wants to keep him out of prison. The speaker says there's a cop in there, but he already tasered him and will be waking up in about 90 seconds, so he better move fast. When he gets there, he gets the cop's gun and orders him to drive at gunpoint. They eventually stop in a desolate area. Darby pulls him out and tells him to get down on his knees, and the cop pleads, saying he won't see his wife and little girl anymore. Then, Darby laughs at him, answers a phone call, and discovers that both his savior and the police are Clyde himself. Darby attempts to shoot him, but the pistol is a trap. Instead, he gets injected with a paralytic substance from a pufferfish, so he won't be able to move, but he'll feel everything, including physical pain. Clyde then strangles him at his warehouse. He puts a tourniquet on him so he won't bleed out and injects him with adrenaline so he won't pass out. Before he tortures him, Clyde informs him that he understands what it's like to feel helpless, 
just like when he watched him slaughter his whole family. Then, he tells the exact phrase he told him, that he couldn't fight fate. Clyde shows him the mirror above, specially designed to witness the horrific fate he can't escape. After that, he begins recording and decapitating Darby. Meanwhile, Nick and Sarah debate lethal injection tampering. Nick believes Darby has nothing to do with it since he lacks the intellect to pull it off. A few moments later, the cops discover Darby in 25 pieces and quickly alert Nick of the horrific discovery. Back in the attorney's office, a colleague, Jonas, talks to Nick and Sarah. He believes Clyde is the only one with all the motives. Nick mentions that he owns the warehouse where they found Darby, and Sarah clarifies that he's a tinkerer and holds two dozen patents that have made him some money. She adds that he liquidated most of his wealth a few years ago to buy industrial properties around airports, chemical plants, and rail yards, which she finds weird. Soon after the discovery, the police arrive at Clyde's house. When he hears the sirens, he casually undresses and welcomes them. He gets arrested, and while the police escort him to the police car, he throws Nick a piercing glare. In the meantime, when the cops investigate Clyde's residence, they discover law books, despite him being an engineer, and also find torn out newsprint on which Nick and Darby clasp hands. Moments later, Clyde awaits interrogation while handcuffed inside the jail's questioning chamber. While outside, the detectives discuss that they don't have any proof against him and can only hope for a confession. On the other hand, at Nick's house, his daughter gets a recording of her recital and begs her mother to see it, but she refuses, stating they will wait for Nick. Nick's daughter then inserts the DVD, only to realize that it isn't her performance but Clyde mutilating Darby. Nick, on the other hand, meets Clyde in the holding cell. He switches off the camera stream, telling him that he doesn't want anyone to hear him say that what he did is right. After that, he switched on the camera and started interrogating him. Clyde indirectly admits that he desires to kill Darby and Rupert and has been planning how to do it in his head. Nick immediately interprets this as his confession and begins to leave. However, Clyde stops him, telling him he might want to cancel his lunch with Judge Roberts and his plans for the rest of the week. When Nick sits down to hear what he has to say, he claims that anything he informed him of was useless because he never expressly admitted to being guilty. Nick says they know he did it. However, he tells him that it's not what he knows but what he can prove in court. He adds that although Darby was discovered dead in his warehouse, he has numerous properties across the country, narcotics pass through them all the time, and Darby is involved in the narcotics trade. Clyde tells him that Nick's the one making deals with murderers, so he tells him he desires a mattress in exchange for an honest confession. However, Nick declines. When Nick goes out, Jonas chastises him for rejecting the deal. He claims that a bet in exchange for a confession is a good deal when there's no evidence. Nonetheless, Nick believes Clyde is playing with them. Yet, Jonas recommends he proceed with the agreement. A detective interrupts them and tells Nick that his family is calling him. When he talks to Kelly, he discovers that his daughter watched the tape of the crime. He then decides they must go through with the deal as they need the confession. The next day, Nick pleads in court to refuse Clyde's bail. On the other side, Clyde decides to represent himself. In his argument, he claims to be a law-abiding citizen, that he's not a flight risk, and that this is his first alleged offense. In addition, he says that the prosecution doesn't have a piece of evidence against him and starts citing the legal precedent, to which the judge agreed. When the judge says she's granting bail, Nick interrupts her and cautions her not to do that. Clyde applauds, stating she would easily let a murderer go after offering her some nice words. Everyone is stunned as he criticizes the judge, causing the judge to deny him bail and send him to jail for contempt of court. Later, in the questioning room, as promised, he acknowledges that the recording Nick watched contained him and explains in detail how he did it. He claims to have one more revelation, but requests something in exchange. Despite Nick telling him he's tired of hearing everything he has to say, Clyde demands a medium-rare steak for lunch and an iPod. They are to be delivered to his cell at precisely 1 p.m. in exchange for the location of Bill Reynolds, Darby's lawyer. After that, Nick arrives at their office, and Sarah informs him that Bill has been missing for three days. Clyde then addresses the camera, telling Nick that if he wants Bill to live, he must fulfill his conditions. The next day, they arrive at Clyde's cell with the food eight minutes late because of the warden's security measures. Once he gets his demands, he informs them of Bill's whereabouts. He also tells them that the 1 p.m. appointment wasn't for him but for Bill and that they should hurry, so they rush to the helicopter. After sharing his meal with a cellmate, he cranks up the sounds and stabs his cellmate with a steak bone. On the other hand, Nick has discovered Bill buried with a time-mechanized mask, but he's already dead. He realizes that if Clyde had his meal on time, Bill would still be alive. Sarah then messages Nick about Clyde killing his cellmate and that the warden will move him to solitary. Later, Nick pays a visit to Clyde in an isolated prison, wondering about his purpose for killing so many people. Clyde claims that he wishes to hold everyone accountable for their acts. 
Nevertheless, Nick offers him his daughter's bracelet and asks whether his family would be happy with him for carrying out revenge in their honor. Still, he says that his daughter and wife won't even feel anything because they're gone. Later that day, Nick and Jonas contact Doug, a former CIA contact. They discovered that Clyde used to work with the agency, designing creative assassination devices and arranging intricate, lethal techniques against seemingly impossible targets. Doug warns them that Clyde can kill anyone whenever he wishes. He wanted to be in jail, and the fellow inmate he murdered wasn't a random act but rather a step toward his real plan. With this knowledge, Nick and Jonas approach the judge and request the violation of Clyde's civil rights and restrict visitation to safeguard everyone's safety. She then agrees and signs the paperwork. Suddenly, her phone rings, and as she answers it, it explodes, shocking Nick and Jonas. Soon after, Nick visits Clyde in a prison interrogation room. He inquires about his collaborator and the purpose of his vengeance. Clyde becomes enraged, saying it's not revenge but the justice system's failures. Because if he only wanted revenge, he would have slaughtered his family 10 years ago. He then demands to get released and drop all charges against him by 6 a.m., or he'll kill everyone. Meanwhile, Nick takes precautionary measures. However, Clyde's deadline passes. When Sarah starts her car, the bombs attached to the vehicles explode, killing Sarah and some of Nick's assistants. Later, Nick sends his family to a safe location for a vacation. Before they leave, he reminds them not to use cards, mobile phones, or anything else that could reveal their whereabouts. When Nick returns home, he sees the framed newspaper item, which indicates that someone has been in his home. When they return to the prison, they take Clyde for a walk, joined by Nick and the detective. Nick beats Clyde out of rage, telling him that Rupert and Darby might have gone free if they had tried to convict them. However, Clyde opposes him and tells him that he doesn't care and that he would have accepted if they failed if Nick at least tried to win the case. Nick demands that he end his plans, but he tells him it's just the beginning of destroying the corrupt system and everyone who supports it. During Sarah's burial, Jonas believes they brought this on themselves. At the same time, Nick still feels they did what was right but is secretly beginning to doubt himself. As they drive away, a man dressed in black commands a military drone equipped with a machine gun, an EMP, and a missile launcher. Then, Jonas' automobile gets hit by anti-tank rounds, and he blows up the car to ensure his death. Later, the mayor approaches Nick and expresses her surprise that Nick has allowed this to continue for so long. Nick is ready for his resignation, but she promotes him to acting district attorney. Then she puts the city on lockdown. Soon after, Nick receives an email from Sarah's contact regarding the real estate that Clyde purchased. He discovers that Clyde owns a little garage rather than a farm near the prison. That night, Nick and the detective go to the garage, where they discover a tunnel leading to a stash of guns, disguises, and other equipment beneath the solitary confinement cells, each having a secret entrance. He realizes that, all along, Clyde wanted to be in solitary so he could quickly leave the prison and carry out his plans, misleading the police into thinking he had accomplices outside. The investigator next searches Clyde's cell, but he's not present. They discover that Clyde has cameras everywhere, including Nick's residence. Evidence points out that his next target is City Hall, where the mayor will hold an emergency meeting. Nick and the detective come shortly afterward. As a precaution, they must gently proceed so as not to alert Clyde that they're after him. They spot Clyde's cart on the fifth floor, directly below the conference room. Then they discover a briefcase, which they believe contains the explosive. The bomb squad officer opens the suitcase and states that it's a cell phone activated suitcase bomb and can detonate at any time. Simultaneously, several agents sent to monitor Clyde's warehouse observe him pulling up and alert Nick. Clyde returns to his underground equipment and watches the conference begin. When Clyde returns to his cell, he finds Nick waiting for him. Clyde inquires if he's present to make one last trade. On the other hand, Nick claims to have discovered what Clyde has tried to convey and says he doesn't bargain with murderers. Nick tries to persuade Clyde to stop what he's planning to do. However, Clyde apologizes and activates the suitcase bomb, causing him to leave while locking Clyde's cell behind him. It turns out that he hid the bomb beneath Clyde's bed. Upon realizing it, Clyde returns to his bed with a smile. He pulls out his daughter's bracelet, then the bomb explodes. The movie ends with Nick watching his daughter's recital, which he previously used to miss. Thanks for watching. Put a like on the video if you liked it, and subscribe to the channel for more videos.